the mechanism of the bainite transformation is perhaps the most intriguing of all solid state transformations. As you will see, this is because there is a separable set of events that occur over a controllable scale of time. And that leads to some quite dramatic changes in the structure. We will also see that the transformation struggles a bit and that struggle leads to a visible refinement of the structure to scales that are finer than of martensite. Uh, you will see uh, in the final lecture in this series that the world's first and only bulk nanostructured metal is based on a bainitic microstructure, which is so incredibly fine that you have something like 100 million square meters of interface in a cubic meter of material. Now, I'll begin by emphasizing the difference between the displacive transformations and the reconstructive transformations. The displacive transformations all, uh, all lead to a plate-shaped transformation product. So here we have martensite plates, here we have bainite, and this is Weedman statin ferrite. Uh, and of course, we have seen in the lecture on martensite that this is a consequence of the shape deformation accompanying these transformations. The reconstructive transformations can only happen at a perceptible rate when the temperature is roughly over 600 degrees centigrade because that's when the iron and the substitutional atoms become uh, relatively mobile. Now, we are interested in the transformation from austenite to ferrite, where austenite is a cubic F unit cell with a motif of one iron atom per lattice point. And ferrite is the cubic I lattice with a motif of one iron atom per lattice point. And you can accomplish this change in structure in two different ways. First of all, we look at the displacive transformation, where there is a deformation which changes the parent structure into that of the product. So here we have our starting configuration of atoms. And let's imagine that's a square lattice and we have two different species of atoms, the red atoms and the iron atoms, both on the substitutional sides. And here we have now changed the structure in the top half to a different arrangement of atoms. Uh, you know, we change from this kind of a unit cell to this kind of a unit cell simply by a deformation. Okay, so this was the original location of the edge, and this is the new location, so this is like a shear deformation. And of course, there can also be a volume change normal to the interface plane here. Now, what I need to explain is that when you get this displacive transformation, uh, there is an atomic correspondence between the parent and the product lattices. So here, for example, if I draw this line through the red atoms, uh, that line is essentially unchanged in terms of near neighbors. Obviously, you know, this is a different lattice, so there will be some change, but all near neighbor atoms are preserved during this transformation, and therefore there is no chemical composition change. Uh, as far as the substitutional atoms are concerned. And the second distinction, of course, is this massive change in the macroscopic shape, which is a reflection of the deformation in going from this blue to the green unit cell. So this will be a strain energy dominated transformation uh, where the shape of the uh, product is essentially determined by the minimization of elastic strain energy. So we next look at the mechanism of reconstructive transformation, uh, where we start with the same atomic configuration in the parent phase, but we are going to rip apart all the atoms and rearrange them into the new pattern, uh, such that the external shape is maintained because 
when we rip all the bonds apart and rearrange, uh, that requires diffusion. And that is like fluid flow, which minimizes the strain energy. So if these, these crystals are surrounded by others. If you don't have a shape change, that dramatically reduces the strain energy component. So here, the transformation was achieved by breaking all the bonds and reconstructing the lattice. And during that process, because there has to be diffusion, you also get a change in chemical composition because uh, these red atoms prefer to be in the product phase than in the parent phase. So there's a partitioning of solute between the parent and product phases. There is no external change in shapes other than a, a volume change, but, but fluid flow can even help to minimize the strain energy due to the volume change. So this transformation is much closer to equilibrium than the displacive transformation. The only reason why displacive transformations happen is because atomic mobility is reduced at low temperatures. Okay. So um, the partitioning of solute, of course, also makes it closer to equilibrium because the parent and product phases usually have different equilibrium compositions, although the chemical potential of the red atoms in the uh, product will be the same as the chemical potential of red atoms in the parent. Okay, so that is um, the uh, reconstructive transformation. So here is a, a summary of the displacive transformation. And let's imagine now, uh, as it is possible in practice, that this can happen in absolutely pure iron. So you can get martensitic transformation in pure iron by cooling at a sufficiently large rate. Uh, so that would lead to a shape deformation, which looks like that. And when we cool the pure iron slowly, we do not get this shape deformation, but we get the change in crystal structure. So you can imagine that to happen in two steps, that you have this displacive transformation, you then cut a triangle off here, and you bring it to this point so that the external shape is maintained. So this, uh, this imaginary operation that we have done is there to emphasize that even when you get ferrite formation by a reconstructive mechanism in pure iron, you would require the diffusion of iron atoms to minimize the strain energy. So this we call reconstructive diffusion and it is an essential part of obtaining ferrite, for example, in pure iron or actually in any alloy. Uh, it is not related to composition change, but it is there to minimize the strain energy. Okay, now obviously there are consequences to what we have already said, and one of the most spectacular consequences is reflected in time temperature transformation diagrams. So here, for example, we have an iron 0.4 weight percent carbon steel, nothing else, and uh, there, there are essentially two C curves in a TT, TTT diagram, uh, one representing the reconstructive transformations such as ferrite and perlite, and the one at lower temperatures representing displacive transformations such as Wiedmannstein, ferrite and bainite, and then we have the modern site here. Um, if the MS temperature was sufficiently low, then we would also have a C curve for the modern site. As I explained, uh, in one of the earlier lectures. Now, when we don't have many alloying elements, the rates of reaction are fast. So these two curves, when you detect them experimentally, might look as if uh, they belong to the same curve. But in fact, they are separate curves with distinct mechanisms of transformation. Now, as soon as we add, uh, for example, manganese, which uh, stabilizes austenite, in other words, it reduces the free energy difference between austenite and ferrite, we get a retardation of both the reconstructive and the displacive transformation and the MS temperature is suppressed because we reduce the driving force different, uh, reduce the driving force for transformation from austenite to uh, the product phase uh, by adding manganese. But remember that this is a logarithmic scale, okay? And 
the retardation of the reconstructive transformations is far greater than of the displacive transformations. And why is that? This is a question that I normally ask in the lectures and expect answers, but as you know, this is a video recording. Uh, well, the thermodynamic effect of manganese is the same for both kinds of reactions. In other words, the difference in free energies between austenite and ferrite uh, caused by manganese will be identical for both kinds of transformations. But here we do not have any diffusion, whereas in this case there is long-range partitioning of alloying elements uh, which are slow to diffuse, uh, i.e. manganese, and therefore reconstructive transformations are retarded to a much greater extent than uh, displacive transformations. Now this is of immense technological importance because when we make large components, it isn't possible to quench them to martensite unless you add huge quantities of expensive alloying elements. Uh, now, if you retard reactions like ferrite and perlite preferentially relative to say bainite, then you make it much easier to obtain bainite. And this is exploited in making very large components. So this is Tracy Cool, who was uh, my PhD student many years ago. Uh, and she's about, um, you know, if my memory serves me correct, she's about five feet, 10 inches tall. So you can imagine the size of the steam turbine, which also extends in this direction towards the left. It's huge, okay? And there is no possibility of obtaining, for example, the shaft by rapid quenching and still having a chemistry which is suitable for all the other properties required, for example, the creep resistance and so forth. So these components in power plant are often bainitic in structure. So the typical steel used might be two and a quarter chromium, 1% molybdenum weight by weight and uh, a certain amount of carbon. And then they are tempered in order to generate uh, alloy carbides, which uh, alloy carbides like uh, molybdenum carbide, chromium carbides, which give it creep resistant and stability at the temperatures where this operates. So the steam temperature could be 600 degrees centigrade and the machine has to operate for something like 40 years. So with very large components, it's not uh, possible or not economical to obtain martensitic structures. So continuous cooling transformation is the much preferred route of transformation and therefore they tend to be bayonetic. Uh, the other advantage of not quenching is that you avoid the distortions associated with a rapid change in temperature in a large component. So bayonite is extremely important from a technological point of view, especially with uh, heavy engineering. And I mentioned to you that, uh, you know, these uh, time temperature transformation diagrams are divided into two parts. We have the reconstructive transformations and the displacive transformations here. And I'm going to focus today on the various forms of bainite. And there are essentially two. Uh, upper bainite looks like this, and this is a typical microstructure scale that the platelets are 10 micrometers in size, in length, and roughly a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. And in upper bainite, the plates are free from carbides, but you have cementite in between the platelets of bainitic ferrite. Uh, lower bainite has a somewhat finer scale, but uh, you know the temperature range is usually not uh, very large, the difference in temperatures at which you get upper and lower bainite. So uh, you can imagine that this is still about 10 micrometers in length and a quarter of a micrometer in thickness, but because the temperature is lower, uh, there is carbide precipitation inside the plates and less carbide precipitation between the plates. Now, why, why does this happen? Uh, 
we will explain later after we know the real mechanism by which bainite forms. But there is an important consequence. These uh, coarse particles of cementite are relatively brittle. So even though lower bainite is stronger than upper bainite, this will tend to be tougher than upper bainite. Usually the toughness goes down as you increase strength, but in this case, the toughness is actually better at a higher value of strength because the carbides are much more refined. There, is, uh, um, there are finer cementite particles here and these are incredibly fine. Okay, so that is the visible difference in microstructure between upper and lower bainite. But note, the scale of this microstructure means that you cannot reveal these details using optical microscopy because visible light has a wavelength of about half a micrometer and these are below the resolution of an optical microscope. Uh, what you would see in an optical microscope for upper bainite is, is this, basically a dark etching region when compared with the untempered martensitic background. Uh, so you can distinguish bainite from martensite if both phases are present because untempered martensite doesn't have much structure and therefore it doesn't etch uh, as prominently. Whereas if you look at the detail inside this, then there are thousands and thousands of tiny platelets, only a quarter of a micrometer in thickness and lots of interfaces between either the cementite or any other residual phase between these platelets, which are attacked by the etchant. And therefore, the bainite appears darker than the surrounding matrix, okay? So optical microscopy cannot reveal the detail that we are interested in. Notice also the lenticular and sharp tips over here, everything pointing towards a displacive transformation mechanism. And lower bainite is essentially the same, uh, but you have, in addition to the phases between the plates, we have these particles of carbide inside the platelets themselves, okay? And we've got, any theory has to be able to explain all these differences in a quantitative manner. Now, I've, I've talked about plates. How do we know that these are plates? Well, you can do two surface analysis. So uh, this is a schematic diagram showing one metallographic surface and another metallographic surface sharing a common edge. And this is obviously an optical micro, and this shows that this is truly a plate shape, the collection of platelets that form uh, bainite themselves are organized in the form of a plate. Now to see the individual platelets, uh, you, you can also do two surface analysis by using focused iron beam to create the two surfaces and then look at how the tiny platelet, which is 10 micrometers in length, goes over that edge using uh, either atomic force microscopy or high resolution scanning electron microscopy. And you'll find a thesis on my website by Sharmik Lenka, which shows you that the individual uh, platelets, the very fine platelets are actually platelets, okay? Now, if we change the crystal structure by deformation, then obviously when the bainite forms, the shape of the transformed region must change. Okay, so this is a, a movie taken using um, confocal laser microscopy. And this is the temperature. And as we drop the temperature, we will get a bainitic transformation. So there you go, beautiful, beautiful surface relief due to the displacements associated with the bainite transformation. You know, if, if you didn't know this was bainite, this would look like an earthquake happening with mountains being created. Okay, so that is the shape deformation on a scale which is optical because each one of these uh, austenite grains, which are identified by the thermal grooves, uh, are of the order of uh, 20 micrometers in size. So 
Over there, we are not looking at the shape deformation of an individual platelet, but a cluster of platelets with all the residual phases in between. So it can be misleading, okay? Uh, the literature is full of, uh, full of uh, statements where, which are drawn from uh, observations on a core scale. What you can do, of course, is look at individual platelets uh, because we have all the techniques now. Uh, and the next slide will show you uh, the upheavals caused by individual platelets of bainite. So this is an atomic force microscope image of a sample which was first polished completely flat and then transformed partially to bainite. And these are the upheavals caused by bainite. And obviously, uh, that is a clear shear deformation, right? And these are the sharp tips of the bainite plates. Uh, this is the austenite, the untransformed austenite. Now, I want you to focus also on this region here, which is, this is austenite, but notice that it has relaxed. It has undergone plastic deformation adjacent to this platelet caused by this large displacement due to bainite formation. Uh, and that plastic relaxation happens because the bainite fo is forming at a temperature where the austenite is mechanically weaker than you would associate with martensite. So it relaxes plastically, uh, and I can show you schematically. Uh, this would be an elastically accommodated plate where this surface is flat and so is this surface. Here, the austenite has relaxed by plastic deformation and therefore the plastic deformation introduces lots of defects in that region. So if I, if I look at a transmission electron micrograph of an interface between the bainite and the relaxed austenite, there are clouds of dislocation. So this is the austenite and this is the upper bainitic ferrite and you can see this a contrast due to a heavy presence of dislocations at the interface. Now, dislocations can move, okay? But if you put obstacles in their path, then they get pinned. And this is a, a nice movie, and I'm, I'm using, uh, using this to illustrate that dislocations struggle when they come across, um, across obstacles. And this is a molecular dynamic simulation of a dislocation trying to pull away from an interstitial atom. So there it is, it is sort of pinned. The, the, the sort of motions that you see is because this is a simulation for 300K, so the atoms are not stationary. And this is a cyclic boundary condition, so you see it again and again. But you can see even just an interstitial atom can pin a dislocation uh, for a significant fraction of its time uh, as it passes through the crystal. In this simulation, you're only seeing the atoms which are not at a particular average position because, uh, because uh, of the distortion at the core of the dislocation and so forth. So a single interstitial atom can reduce the mobility of the dislocation. So imagine what this cluster of atoms, a cluster of dislocations that I illustrated, uh, caused by the plastic relaxation of austenite would do. It would completely kill the glycyl interface, which consists of an array of dislocations. Uh, it simply would not be able to move. So the bainite plate would grow to a certain size and then kill itself by the plastic relaxation that's happened, the interface can no longer move, okay? So this is an effect called mechanical stabilization. So if the austenite contains quite a lot of defects, then it will tend to retard displacive transformations. I can show you this uh, really quite elegantly on a macroscopic uh, sample. So this is a, a sample uh, which were, during its austenitic state, was flattened into this shape. So you can see that this has barreled out and therefore the plastic strain distribution is not homogeneous. The maximum, um, the maximum 
classic deformation happens in this X-like region. And therefore, we will see in the next micrograph that bainite hardly forms in this region because the austenite has been stabilized by dislocation debris. Whereas here, where there is a, a zero um, plastic strain, you will get lots of bainite. So here is the region with very little plastic strain. And you can see we've got lots and lots of bainite. Here is the region with intense plastic deformation in the austenite prior to transformation. And we see very few plates of bainite. Okay? Now, this is a wonderful way of proving whether a transformation is displacive or reconstructive. It is only displacive transformations that are retarded in this manner, a process called mechanical stabilization, because when a reconstructive transformation happens, it actually destroys any defects that it encounters. So that gain in energy by destroying those defects actually accelerates the transformation exactly like in recrystallization. So you can think about a reconstructive transformation as a combination of recrystallization and crystal structure change, whereas recrystallization doesn't involve a crystal structure change. Okay? So unlike reconstructive transformations, mechanical stabilization can only retard a displacive transformation. Okay? So when we have a glissal interface, it will be hindered by any obstacles present in the parent phase, whereas here we have diffusion happening. So there's a chance for defects to be eliminated completely. And that gain in free energy accelerates a reconstructive transformation. Okay, so everything because of that plastic relaxation of the shape deformation of bainite at temperatures where the austenite is relatively weak, uh, creating this dislocation debris. And of course, uh, the, as the interface advances, uh, it is not halted immediately. So some of the dislocations in the austenite are also inherited inside the bainitic ferrite, because when you have a displacive transformation, a dislocation remains a dislocation, uh, maybe a different character, but it remains a dislocation in the product that is. And this is why uh, martensite, which forms at a high temperature or bainite, uh, contain dislocation density. It's nothing to do with the displacive transformation mechanism uh, in the sense that if the displacements were elastically accommodated, there would be no need for, uh, the, the plates of martensite or bainite would be clean, free of dislocations. These dislocations are directly a consequence of plastic relaxation in the austenite and subsequent growth of bainite into that region. But, once you reach a critical value of the debris, the stress driving the interface, which comes from the chemical free energy change, can no longer overcome the pinning by the debris. So there are quantitative models to predict when this would happen and are consistent with experimental observations. So this means that bainite plates, even if they don't collide with an austenite grain boundary, will stop before they fully evolve uh, before they um, reach a formidable barrier like an austenite grain boundary. So if you look at uh, the optical microstructure illustrated here, the dark regions, as I said to you, are clusters of bainite plates. And uh, they etch darker because they are clusters of bainite plates with intervening phases. So there are lots of interfaces for the etching to attack, whereas the martensite in the background is untempered and therefore has very little structure. Now, if I, you know, with a very difficult experiment, if I can look at the whole of this sheaf of platelets in a transmission electron microscope, I would be able to resolve what's going on. And here is um, such an observation. Look at the scale here. And the reason why I say this is a difficult experiment is that it's very difficult to get uh, an area of the thin foil that we use in the transmission electron microscope that is so large, okay? So what appears in the optical microscope to be a single plate is actually a cluster of thousands of platelets. This is a montage of electron micrographs. This continues at this point. 
And the important point I want you to notice from this is that the length of a platelet and the thickness of a platelet at the beginning here, uh, near the osnide grain boundary, is the same as near the tip of that cluster of platelets, right? So these platelets are growing to a size of roughly 10 micrometers and getting halted by mechanical stabilization. So you have to form a new platelet and new platelet and new platelet, and the whole sheaf evolves in the form of a plate because again, that minimizes the overall strain energy, a very, very clever struggle that bainite goes through, which leads to a remarkable refinement of structure because if this was martensite, it would form as a single coarse plate, okay? So there is no thermomechanical processing method which can give you a grain size, which is a quarter of a micrometer because for a thin plate shape, the mean free slip distance is approximately twice the thickness, okay? So this is a huge refinement of the structure. And grain refinement is one of the few methods where you can increase strength and toughness at the same time. Okay, so um, these little platelets are lens shaped with uh, sharp tips, as you can see here, and they are very fine. And we can see the shape deformation both due to the individual platelet and due to the overall collection of platelets in a sheaf of platelets. We can also look at the interface between austenite and the bainitic ferrite using, um, using an atom probe so that we can actually see the distribution of elements. So this is uh, an experiment that I, I did with Bob Wall back in 1981, where you know, each dot here represents uh, an atom in the field ion microscope. And we have here, uh, ferrite on this side and austenite on this side, the bainitic ferrite and austenite. And this is the distribution of iron atoms because we pass the atoms through a time of flight uh, mass spectrometer so we can identify what the species is. And you can see that the distribution of silicon is completely homogeneous across the interface. Okay, So there is no, cons uh, there is no partitioning of substitutional atoms on the finest conceivable scale. However, look over here. These are carbon atoms, okay? And they have uh, partitioned preferentially into the austenite. So do we conclude that the transformation is displacive, but the carbon atoms which are in interstitial sites and therefore do not affect the change in structure, uh, diffuse and partition during the transformation so that the bainitic ferrite never has an excess of carbon. So let's examine that hypothesis a, a little bit more. And so we are looking now at the evolution of bainite as a function of time, okay? And I want to, um, I want to um, do this um, with certain assumptions, okay? So first, first of all, I will assume that a plate of bainite grows exactly like martensite, right? That means it cannot form if the composition of the austenite is beyond the T0 curve. But we are operating at temperatures where the interstitial element is much more mobile than the substitution solids, and it doesn't like being inside the lattice of the product. So it partitions into the remaining austenite. And in the case of lower bainite, uh, you do get partitioning, but the temperature is lower. So there is an opportunity for the excess carbon that was present here to precipitate inside the plate of bainitic ferrite and less to precipitate between the plates. And this immediately gives you a way to explain the difference between upper and lower bainite. And all this can be modeled quantitatively. So the partitioning of excess carbon from the plate of martensite that forms initially, and the kinetics of the cementite precipitation inside the platelet, because you know, the partition doesn't happen instantaneously. It will happen over a period of time. And therefore, 
if the temperature is low enough, there's an opportunity for carbides to precipitate inside the plate, just as in tempered martensite. And that would explain the observed uh, very fine microstructures that we see. So if I calculate the time taken for the carbon to escape from the plate of uh, supersaturated uh, bainite, which forms first, then actually it's very short, all right? For a typical steel, it, it is a matter of seconds. Now, this means that by the time I do an experiment, for example, by putting it into an atom probe or other equipment, things have changed, okay? So how can I prove that the bainite actually forms without any diffusion in the first instance? I cannot do that by using uh, microanalytical equipment of any form because by the time I come to observe, things will have changed. Well, there, there is a way and that it goes back to the T0 curve that I described in the last lecture. So here we have um, the free energy curve of ferrite and the free energy curve of austenite. And of course, the equilibrium phase boundaries A1 and A3 are defined by the common tangent, which gives you equal chemical potentials of the solutes in alpha and in gamma, solutes and solvent actually. Uh, so they have different compositions at equilibrium. Uh, but there is also a point here where the free energies of the parent and product phases of the same composition are identical. And if I plot the locus of these points as a function of temperature, I get this line, which is the T0 line. And if my austenite has this composition, then it would require an increase in free energy for it to undergo a, comp uh, a transformation without composition change. However, if the austenite is of this composition, there would be a reduction of free energy if it transformed into the ferrite of the same composition. So diffusion-less transformation is only possible if the composition of the austenite falls below this T0 curve, okay? And that gives us a way of deciding whether bainite initially formed without any diffusion uh, or not. So, uh, imagine uh, that X bar is the average carbon concentration of our alloy. So that will be the composition of the austenite when we begin our transformation experiment, uh, thought experiment at this temperature. And let's assume that a plate of bainite has formed without any diffusion at all. So we are operating at a temperature where the carbon atoms can escape from the plate of bainite, and therefore the next plate of bainite forms from austenite, which has a different chemical composition. And this process continues until the austenite composition reaches this T0 boundary. This mechanism cannot operate, uh, you know, the, the mechanism in which bainite first forms without any diffusion at all. Uh, it cannot operate if the austenite composition is beyond the T0 curve, okay? So, supposing that we measure the composition at which the austenite stops transforming into bainite, that would be a very strong indication of what happens in the initial event, okay? But, so let me now uh, look at the other scenario where the plate of bainite never has an excess of carbon so as it grows, uh, the carbon is pushed ahead of the transformation interface. Now, in that case, uh, it, there is no limitation. It cannot stop, uh, the T0 condition doesn't apply. And in principle, they should continue until the composition of the austenite reaches the equilibrium phase boundary, which is the A3 curve. I've marked it as A3 dash because the substitutional atoms are not moving. Now, in practice, the difference between this line and this line is very large, okay? So by measuring the composition of the austenite, we can actually tell whether it's this mechanism where the 
Phenytic pyrite never has an excess carbon or the other mechanism which I talked about earlier. Now, of course, uh, when doing uh, the T0 calculation, uh, we have to take account of strain energy because that's a large component of a displacive transformation. And because the Baynard plates are finer, they have a smaller aspect ratio of about 0 0.02. So the, store, uh, the energy due to the displacive transformation is of the order of 400 joules per mole, the strain energy uh, caused by this shape deformation. But these are, the values of the shear and dilatation are very similar to those of martensite. So to take account of strain energy, I'm, I'm going to use the T0 dashed curve, yeah, uh, which accounts for strain energy as well. Uh, and that would raise the ferrite free energy curve relative to that of the osner. And when we do experiments, you can see that the reaction stops basically when diffusion less transformation becomes impossible. And notice the, the huge difference between this and this. These are real calculations and real experiments. So, our conclusion is that the transformation happens in a sequence. Uh, where we form a platelet of martensite first, and then because of uh, mechanical stabilization, its growth stops, and you get the carbon partitioning into the remaining austenite. Okay. This has other consequences that look, if I transform to bainite uh, at this temperature, I will get less bainite than this because the tolerance of the austenite for carbon is smaller at higher temperatures. So you can see clearly that you suppress the amount of bainite that forms as the temperature goes towards the bainite start temperature. Okay, and at the bainite start temperature, you get zero bainite. Okay. So this is called the incomplete reaction phenomenon because Equilibrium would tell you that this reaction should stop when the carbon concentration of the austenite reaches this value. So thermodynamically, this is an incomplete reaction. Uh, given a huge amount of time, uh, the transformation can proceed further by a reconstructive mechanism so that the composition of the austenite reaches this value here. Okay, so just to summarize, um, Growth is diffusionless, and of course, it's a displacive transformation, so we must take account of strain energy. Now, there are many other consequences of this simple set of uh, conclusions. Uh, one is that if we can observe individual platelets of bainite growing, then they would grow much faster than permitted by the diffusion of carbon. Note my emphasis on individual platelets, which are you know, of the order of a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. So things like hot stage optical microscopy or confocal laser microscopy are no good. Uh, there is a technique called photo emission electron microscopy, where you can put a bulk sample into uh, a machine, an electron microscope, uh, and you shine uh, UV light onto it and that causes it to emit electrons and the sample is hot. In other words, uh, you know, you can make it austenitic inside the microscope. And then, you know, those electrons that are emitted, you treat with the same sort of lenses as we do in normal electron microscopy. So the resolution is much higher. I'm going to show you a sequence of four images uh, taken using a photo emission electron microscope. And I want you to focus on, on this region here and you will see individual platelets of bainite growing, okay? So that is after one second. This is after two seconds, and you can see other, other platelets forming because the structure is evolving as a sheep and, and, and so on, okay? So we can directly measure the growth rate of individual platelets. And when we analyze that, that is three orders of magnitude greater then would be permitted by diffusion control, carbon diffusion controlled growth. Okay, so completely consistent with the mechanism that we have deduced. And similarly, uh, we can predict the transition 
from upper bainite to lower bainite, uh, the temperature at which we get upper bainite and the temperature at which lower bainite uh, is generated using this simple model. And you know, when we first did this, uh, there were some really quite surprising results. So here we are plotting temperature versus carbon concentration. And notice that at low carbon concentrations, uh, isothermal transformation would lead to perlite here, would lead to upper bainite, and then uh, to martensite. So there is no region of lower bainite because when the carbon concentration is slow, uh, is small, the carbon can escape rapidly into the remaining austenite. So for low carbon concentrations, less than about 0.4 in iron carbon alloys, 0.4 weight percent, you will not actually get a low bainitic microstructure. And with high carbon uh, steels, uh, you would, the, the prediction that you'd go from perlite uh, during isothermal transformation to low bainite during isothermal transformation and then martensite, but no upper bainite. And there is a very narrow region here of concentrations where you get all four perlite, upper bainite, lower bainite, and martensite. Now, when we did these calculations, this went completely against the grain of everything that was written, uh, including in an early edition of uh, my book with Honeycomb. Uh, so we delayed publishing this, but then searching through the literature, we came across these results. So these are high carbon, iron carbon, steels by Oka and Okamoto, and it shows very clearly that there is no upper bainite. You go directly from perlite to lower bainite and then to martensite. Okay? And then uh, Omori and Honeycomb had done some experiments uh, back in the uh, early 1970s, where you can see that for carbon concentrations less than about 0 0.4, you go from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. There's no intervening region of lower bainite. So those two morphological descriptions are manifestations of the same thing, but in the case of lower bainite, because of the lower transformation temperature, there is an opportunity to precipitate carbides inside the plate if the carbon concentration is sufficiently high and the diffusion of carbon into the residual austenite doesn't uh, mess things up, okay? So, that is the mechanism of the bainite transformation. In the next lecture, we will use this information to design some spectacular steels. Thank you.